And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrinterCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at printermarketing.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of PrinterCast with me, Don Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. I'm back. He is indeed. He is indeed. <laughs> Hello, sir. How was this week for you? It's been fantastic. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, some new stuff. Hopefully, people who are part of the Preneur community will see in the inbox over the coming weeks, which is super exciting. But uh, no, all really good stuff happening. Cool. Uh, this week, folks, we've got another great conversation that Pete's had with an author. This week, it's Josh Kaufman, the author of The Personal MBA, and now his new book is called The First 20 Hours, which is a book about rapid skill acquisition. Now, before we get into that conversation, uh, which I, as always, recommend that you get out your pencil and paper if you can, or be willing to listen to it again when you get back from walking the dog, um, what's been going on with you this, uh, this week? In fact, the last couple of weeks, Pete, because uh, you went AWOL. And uh, <laughs> actually, as, as I said in, in last week's show that I did on my own, um, you've been kind of spending time focusing on single projects, as we always recommend, serial versus parallel. So what have you been up to? Um, oh, look, definitely been doing a lot of writing for the blog and stuff like that. So there's some really cool stuff. If you don't regularly check out preneurmarketing.com, uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. There's a, a series on there which was posted uh, earlier this week um, around email marketing tools. Now, a lot of people probably listen, you know, use Aweber or MailChimp um, to sort of manage their, their business. And we actually um, did a whole uh, really intensive, I'd say, audit of all the different platforms available for our businesses, not just printer marketing, but also the e-com businesses and uh, uh, the telco and everything else we have our fingers in, and came to the conclusion that for the information marketing style projects, you know, printer marketing type stuff, um, to actually go with a self-hosted email service um, to increase deliverability and control. So uh, basically wrote this whole um, series of posts between myself and, the, and some of the staff writers to actually kind of help everyone sort of go through that jungle of working out what is the different uh, email services available, why you would go hosted versus, um, you know, the self-hosted options like the cloud-based sort of Aweber's, MailChimp's, Infusionsoft's of the world versus something you can host and manage yourself. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty in-depth series and had some really good response from the email and, you know, comments are starting to, to you know, flow into those posts as well. So uh, that's been a lot of fun um, going through that whole process and obviously writing writing that. Um, then had my uh, – what other projects we were working on? Uh, some secret stuff. I can't really talk about a couple of the, the telco various uh, businesses. We're going through some changes there, which is exciting. So that will hopefully uh, be announced uh, over the next few months, which is pretty cool. Um, some new websites coming live for those businesses as well, which is pretty intense. And, yeah, just kind of uh, plowing down, working in the trenches a little bit the last week or so on a few projects, which is, uh, which is always fun when you sort of get to do a deep dive in something for a while. Yeah, and there's something that we're going to be talking about real soon that I, I'll just say look forward to next week's show where we will be talking about a big project that you've Ah, a new piece been of software. Just getting out the door. A new you? piece of software. So that'll be a lot of fun. So we've been working on that. That's sort of, uh, you know, it hasn't been a lot of my time the last week or so because that's been, uh, you know, using some outsources and some developers to put together a new app. Um, but we'll talk about all that, yeah, in next week's show, which I'm super excited to release and talk about. Cool. Now, I'll just, just reflect back on the uh, the email piece. I, as, Pete, as you say, it is incredibly in-depth, really well-researched, kind of behind the scenes look at your thinking and the reasoning behind your decisions now just to you know we have such a wide range of listeners on the show and, and i think the first thing i would say is don't kind of skip over that the, the knowledge about email or, or what we call autoresponder systems because having regular contact with your customers is a big thing Mm. Um, and these email autoresponder systems, whatever level that you get involved with it, is an incredibly powerful tool. In fact, I think Pete, we should maybe you know, talk about the principles of it um, in, a, in another show, or maybe you'll, you, it's an opportunity for you to put another post on the blog just at a, a more introductory level to just explain to people why they should care. Well, I think we should actually um, absolutely put into into a future edition of the show because you know, cool. from from our perspective, you know, we use email in a lot of different areas of the business, but. 
one of the real prime profit generating areas is that transactions per period as part of the seven yep. levers framework, which I'm sure is what you're sort of you know, directing this conversation towards is that, you know, in our e-commerce, in the Simply Headsets business, one of the e-commerce projects we have, we've got an autoresponder sequence that is all about getting clients to come back and buy from us again. And, you know, in the very first blog post in the series that we're talking about here, I actually took some snippets out of some replies that we got from people. And those snippets were taken from, I think, a one-day period or a two-day period of responses to the autoresponder sequence from people really engaged with the actual series, which is obviously in turn causing an increase in transactions per period, which is the goal of the levers that, that we talk about in the seven levers of business. Absolutely. That's exactly where I was going. So, yeah, so I really do think we should uh, we should pick up on that in another show. Sounds like a good plan. Um, but in the meantime, folks, if you're already using email autoresponder systems, then definitely go take a look at that series of articles because uh, it's, it's a great piece of work that Pete's put together uh, over at printermarketing.com. So, that said, uh, shall we uh, hop into your conversation with Josh? Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's dive in and sort of learn how to gain skills much faster. Josh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, mate. Thanks. Great to be here. Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, the, the first 20 hours, love it. And the thing that I, you know, not, I guess not surprised me, but I found really interesting is you talk about rapid skill acquisition and deliberately sort of differentiate that from mastery, which obviously, you know, Robert Greene talks about, who we've had on the show, and, and Tim Ferriss to sure. a certain extent, who we had on the show as well. Do you want to sort of explain that differentiation, sort of set the scene a little bit? Yeah, so so a lot of the books and resources and courses and uh, everything about skill acquisition over the past, you know, call it decade or so, has all been really, you know, focused on the long game, right? What mm -hmm. does it take to become the best in the world at, at something? Yep. And, you know, the, the, that whole conversation really started back in like 2007, 2008, uh, when Malcolm Gladwell published Outliers. Yeah. Uh, which which pub very publicly broadcast some research by Dr. K. Anders Ericsson of Florida State University about research ab about that topic. What does it take to become the best at something? So Dr. Erickson was was researching things like you know if if you want to step onto a golf course and be able to compete with Tiger Woods, mm. what does that process look like? How much are you going to practice to, need to practice to get there? And his answer was this whole idea of the 10,000 hour rule it takes about 10,000 hours to quote unquote master a new skill or, or become one of the best in the world at, at whatever it is that you're doing. And so the skill acquisition and, and learning rapid learning books that, that have come out over the past decade or so have all really been focused on that mastery uh, aspect or mastery take on, on the sub subject. But I was actually interested in, in quite the opposite. What if you're, you're not so concerned about being the best in the world at something? What if it's, it's, you want to learn something to get a particular result? Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe you're learning something for your business. Maybe you're curious about a, a per personal interest or a hobby. And so you're interested, but you have absolutely no idea where to start. You don't know where to begin. It's frustrating. It's intimidating. What does it take to learn something new? So not the, the, the really long game of skill acquisition. What does the first zero to call it 20 hours of practice, what does that look like? And how can we uh, learn as much as we possibly can and improve as much as we're capable of in the early hours of skill acquisition? Mm. I think as part of it too is obviously that those first 20 hours can be quite uh, hard for a lot of people just to sort of stick through it, keep their bum in their seat, so to speak, and, and get through it as well. So sort of having a, a good plan and, and um, process to follow is kind of very helpful too, I would imagine. Yeah, it's actually a double challenge. So getting started, so so going from being interested to to even putting in your first 10 minutes of practice, that's a hurdle in and of itself, right? So what does it take to get started actually practicing something? And then once you start practicing, those early hours are always frustrating. For everybody, because you're horrible and you know you're horrible. And and so what does it take to get started? And what does it take to make sure when you get started, you put in enough practice to actually see some results from your practice? Mm. And so the method that I talk about in the first 20 hours is designed to do just that. It's it's designed to help you identify something you want to learn, figure out a smart strategy to get started, and then make sure you practice long enough to see results. And in in my experience, it, it, you can go from knowing absolutely nothing about what you're doing to being really, 
really demonstrably good in about 20 hours. Awesome. So you mentioned a word there quite a bit, which I really want to delve into in, in the conversation, and the word is practice. But before yes. we go there, can you sort of give a little bit of a cheat sheet for people who haven't read the book yet and sort of you know, inspire them to go out and buy it in terms of some of these um, steps you're talking about? Yeah, so, so the general method of learning anything, and, and, and I, when I say anything, I really do mean anything. It, it could be anything from uh, a skill that you would use at, at work uh, to something that you just want to do for the fun of it. Uh, so, so things that require physical movement called motor skills or cognitive skills, anything that you can practice in a way that, that can improve, uh, the method applies to. And, and the core method for, for rapid skill acquisition is, is very straightforward. Uh, the first thing is just decide what you want to do, right? I, I, I call this uh, setting a target performance level. Specify exactly what it is you want to be able to do when you're done. Uh, a lot of people, the, the common mistake at, at this stage is is saying, uh, I want to learn golf or I want to learn how to speak French. And the problem with those kinds of constructions is they're way too general. They're way too broad to be be very useful. Mm. So step one is decide, like, what exactly do you want to be able to do in as specific terms as possible uh, before you get started? Because the the more you specify it, the easier it is to figure out ways to get there as as quickly as possible. Mm. So I, I step you, one is decide what you want. I was going to say, I think you mentioned in the book from memory the, the the quote that, you know, a well-defined problem is half solved, or I'm sure I've just yes. completely messed that quote up, but that's kind of the, the, the essence of it anyway. No, absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's I think that was a, a Peter Drucker quote. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, another quote that I, I put in there was, was by Voltaire, which is, you know, uh, no problem can withstand the assault of sustained thinking. And so, you know, what we're really trying to do in this process is be very clear what it is exactly we want to be able to do and then formulate a smart strategy to get started and practice that thing so you can get there as quickly as, as possible. Mm. So after you decide what you want, the next step is, is to deconstruct whatever it is that you, you uh, are practicing or, or want to learn into smaller parts. So most skills are actually just bundles of, of much smaller subskills. So uh, imagine, good illustration of this is, imagine a game like golf. So be good at golf is, is not very helpful because it's not very specific. But if you think about it, all golf is, is is really just a collection of much smaller skills that you use in combination, right? Mm, absolutely. So, so, you know, hitting a ball off the tee with the driver is very different from putting the ball in the hole on the green with a putter is very different from chipping out of the bunker. So there's there's a lot of things that you do in the context of playing golf, but in isolation, they're all very different. So so step two is just break whatever it is that you're doing down into those small parts because those are the things you can actually actually practice. I think let me let me ask you this question. I'm going to stop you there because try if we equate this to business, and I think I see this so often talking to to people in our community who listen to the show and just people in general who are trying to be quote unquote entrepreneurs and start a business is that they want to, you know, become a business person and, and, you know, quote unquote again, master this art of business. But they, they, they have a problem seeing the forest from the trees and actually breaking it down to realizing that the business comes down to things like traffic generation, conversion, repeat business, maximizing your profits. And obviously, you know, the skill required to do each of those five, six or seven key elements of business, they, they have trouble actually seeing that forest from the trees. So is there any sort of real easy way to sort of have that deconstruction happen and, and work out that in a game of golf, it's a bit more clear that you've got to yeah. you know, tee off and you've got putting and you've got all that sort of stuff. Is there, is there a skill around that? There, there is. Actually, actually uh, this, this is a subject near and dear to my heart because uh, my first book, uh, The Personal MBA, yep. Master of the Art of Business, um, does that. Uh, so, so basically, you can treat business as a skill that can be developed. Uh, it's something that you can practice. It's something that you can learn about. It's something that you can you can intentionally choose to get better at. And so the way that I that I first like to deconstruct business is figure out exactly what every single business does on a fundamental level, right? So so instead of you know imagining a business as something that you do that brings money into your bank account, right? Let's get very specific about that. And so, uh, based on my research, every single business does five things in, in roughly the same order. So, so first off, every business creates something of value, right? Value creation. Mm -hmm. 
every single business goes out into the world and finds people that are interested in whatever it is uh, that they've created. That's marketing, right? Absolutely. Every single business takes the people who are interested in whatever it is that, that's being offered and converts them into a paying customer. That sales. Uh, every single business, after they collect somebody's money, has to deliver what they've promised or they're running a scam. They're not running a business. So <laughs> that's value delivery uh, and customer service. And the fifth part, is looking at all of this activity that's going on and you know as as you're creating value marketing uh selling and deliver, delivering value you are spending money in in terms of of uh your staff and resources and all that stuff you're collecting money in in the form of sales and so finance is basically just looking at all the money that's going in, in coming in and all the money that's going out and answering two very important questions is more money flowing in than flowing out right if not, you're in trouble. Yep. And very importantly, is it enough? Is it enough mm. to make all of this effort that you're putting forth worthwhile? Because if it's not, you're probably going to close the business and do something else. And so if you break business, which is this really big topic, into those five very specific parts, value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, finance, all of a sudden it becomes way easier to look at a business or to analyze a business idea and have a very clear picture about how it's going to work. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's perfect because that's the thing is you can look at each one of those five areas and work out where you're currently deficient and then find the skills required to actually enhance the finance side of your business or the, the marketing yeah. side of your business. And that's, that's, that's a great sort of analysis of, of that. So, so yeah. we've, we've, we've deconstructed business. What's, what's the third uh, step? So, so the third step in, in uh, picking up a new skill as quickly as possible is to research just enough to figure out what the most important subskills are that you should practice first, but not so much that the research becomes a form of procrastination in and of itself, <laughs> right? This, this is a big problem a that I had right, before right. I did this research. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, like, so for example, um, in the process of, of researching the, the first 20 hours, I was field testing this approach. I want to make sure that it works before I teach it to people. And so I was, uh, I was learning how to uh, program. I was, I was writing web applications in Ruby, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time, just hadn't learned it yet. And so, you know, my inclination there is, okay, I'm going to learn how to program. So I'm going to get 10 books about programming and I'm going to, you know, buy these three courses and I'm going to read all the books and go through all the courses and then I'm going to sit down and write my first program. When really that was completely, completely misguided because reading books doesn't help you learn how to program, right? It can help you do that more efficiently if you know what you're doing. But in general, it's much easier to just identify the most important subskills and jump straight into it yeah. and then leave the, the, the learning and the research for times where you, are, you have a specific problem practicing whatever it is that you're trying to do or trying to, to accomplish something specific and you use the reference material to help you solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so you want to research just enough so you can jump in and start pra actually practicing whatever it is that you want to do as quickly as you can. I think that's a big problem with the, the education system and a lot of courses and things like that. Is it's oh, yeah. more about this learning sort of stuff and this uh, understanding acquisition as opposed to skill acquisition. Exactly. So, so most modern academic contexts place high value on memorization and regurgitation, and that's pretty much it. When really, when you look at all of the, uh, the skill acquisition research that, that's been done over the, the past six or seven decades, it's very, very clear that the only thing that really helps you improve, and you know, if we define skill as, as something where performance in the real world matters, Right, it's mm -hmm. not just a memorization thing. You're you you are training yourself to perform something specific in, in in a very real capacity. Memorization doesn't help you. The only thing that actually helps you is practicing the thing that you want to be able to do in the context in which you want to be able to do it. Right. Yep. So so for example, if you want to learn how to draw or want to learn how to play the guitar, uh, you can read fifty books about learning to draw. And if you never pick up a pencil and start sketching something, you will not improve one bit. Not going to help at all. Yes. You need to build, build those, uh, is it neuron connectors sort of actually by doing the, the, the thing over and over again? Exactly, exactly. So the only thing that really helps you perform is practicing, which helps your brain physically change itself to, uh, to complete the neural connections that allow 
was you to move your body or or call up certain memories or call up certain things that actually helps you perform. So so really, you know, it, it, it's just like, you know, it, let, let's say you want to learn a new language, like, like Spanish or French. You could read a grammar book on, on that. And you could, you could read 100 grammar books. But when it comes to actually speaking with a person in the language and understanding what they're saying, you're not going to get there until you actually practice that thing. So just skip the grammar mm. books. Jump in to start practicing, trying to understand uh, speaking with a real person. You'll get there way quicker. Cool. And, and the final uh, part of the, the, four, the four steps of skill acquisition? Yeah, there, there's actually two more. Oh, so, I, so I can't uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So, so number four is is remove barriers to practice. Yeah. So anything that just distracts you or gets in the way of sitting down and practicing the skill that you want to learn in context is something that you need to ruthlessly remove. And and those barriers can can look like all sorts of different things. So turn off the TV, uh, turn off your cell phone, close the door, block your internet connection if you can. Uh, anything that that uh, when you're in in the process of practicing something and it's and the going gets rough, we have an incredible tendency to look for distractions, right? So so eliminate them from your environment, remove them. So when you're actually sitting down to practice, it's way easier to stay focused on what it is you're trying to do. Mm, we've spoken about that a lot on the, on, on past episodes of, of Preneurcast here, and and it's you know what I term positive constraints, and, and putting positive yes. constraints in place to to basically force yourself to do what you want to do. Um, so you know, there's a whole ways you can do that. You can use, as you said before, internet blocking things, which I use every morning to turn off Facebook and Twitter and news.com.au yep. to sort of make sure I don't have that habit of a, a, a quick alt tab to see sort of you know what people are having for breakfast on Instagram. So those sort of positive constraints make a huge difference to uh, your ability to actually take action. Yeah, and and this is this is where the method actually uh, starts incorporating a, a lot of of what uh, has been found in behavioral psychology for, for the past couple decades mm. of how, how can we make it easy for ourselves to do the thing that we want to be doing instead of the thing that our brain kind of wants to do because it's easier than what we're, we're focusing on right now. And so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of that is eliminating distractions. The other thing that you can do is just change the structure of the environment around you uh, to make it as easy as possible or, or to, to allow you to expend as little energy as possible to start practicing, right? So mm. in, instead of, let's say you want to play the guitar, if the guitar is in its case in a closet on the other side of your house, you're never going to pick it up, mm. right? So a very easy thing to do is instead of relying on relying or, uh, on yourself to remember that the guitar is there and to expend the energy going to get it every time to practice, the fix is really simple. Get it out of the closet, get it out of the case, put a stand right by the, the couch or chair that you sit on all the time and just put the guitar there and keep it there. And if all it takes to start practicing is, is reaching over two feet, picking it up and starting to play, you're going to spend way more time practicing than if it were anywhere else. Mm, absolutely. Just re re reduce and remove as much friction as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, love it. So step four, remove barriers to practice. And, and the fifth is very simple. Pre-commit to at least 20 hours of practice before you start practicing. And that pre-commitment is, is very important for, for two primary reasons. The first is it's, it's a very valuable check on your priorities and values mm. at the moment, right? So, so we all, I think, carry, carry around a lot of things that for whatever reason, we feel like we should be learning. But when you actually check how much capacity and how much energy and how much attention you have, and you ask yourself the question, am I willing to really rearrange my schedule to, to do half an hour, 45 minutes of practice a day for the next month? Am I really serious about sitting down and learning this thing? A lot of times you find that you're not. So it's, it's an interest, but it may not be valuable enough to spend your time and attention on right now. So, you know, if, if you're not willing to pre-commit to putting at least 20 hours of, of practice into something, it's a really good signal. It's not very important to you right now uh, to begin with, which is great. Just drop it temporarily and go do something else. Yeah. Uh, so that, that can save you a tremendous amount of time. The pre-commitment serves another purpose, which is the first few hours of practice 
you're going to be horrible. It's just kind of a, <laughs> a fact of life, right? Absolutely. And so what, what research says is, is that those early hours of practice are incredibly productive. You you improve dramatically, even in the first, you know, call it one to three hours of practice. Going from nothing to, to being reasonably good doesn't take very much time at all. The big barrier is since those early hours of practice are so frustrating, you need to make sure that you're willing to push through that early frustration long enough to see results. Mm. And so the the whole idea of of the first 20 hours is 20 hours is about the threshold where no matter what you're practicing, if you, pr- if you put at least 20 hours into the skill, you are going to see dramatic improvements in, in your performance, whatever the skill happens to be. So 20 hours is long enough to see dramatic results, but it's short enough that 20 hours doesn't feel too big or too scary to pre-commit in the first place. Love and it. so if you say... I'm going to do this for at least 20 hours. And if I suck, I'm going to suck for at least 20 hours and that's okay. <laughs> right? Just just making that pre-commitment is a very powerful way to change your behavior. That, that sort of willingness to say, I'm going to suck for 20 hours gives you that sort of freedom to fail as well, which I think is so important for so many people, you know, oh, whether, yeah. whether it's learning to play golf or, or copywriting or whatever skill it might be, touch typing as you talk about in the book, is mm-hmm. that they get scared they have to be awesome within the first session because that's what they see on the, the movies and on all these yeah. Forbes articles and stuff like that. And there's, there's a big problem about that and we kind of have spoken about that before and I don't want to get too much off topic, but, you know, you, you can't compare yourself to what's in the media because they want to highlight the good stories, not the, oh, ab- not the average Joes. And the average Joes are, are what we all are most times and average Joes can be successful. It's just not the, yeah, I- the Zuckerberg effect type scenario. I, th- I think it's it, there's an incredible freedom of of really fully understanding that that it is perfectly normal and actually to be expected mm. that you're gonna you're going to be horrible and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I think the the other thing is is and this this is uh, partly an out, outgrowth of of parts of our educational system as well. You know, there's there's been a been a persistent myth for several decades now on you know it, you need to be good or talented at something. To, to get any value from it, right? Mm. So, so a lot of people, what they'll do is, you know, let's say they want to, uh, to, to pick up the guitar or, or learn how to paint or learn how to draw. And they spend a couple hours doing it. And it's, it's very clear that, that they don't have any skill in, in doing that. So the drawing stinks or, or, you know, the guitar's out of tune or you can't play anything to save your life. And there's an incredible tendency for people to when, when faced with that early frustra- frustration to say, oh, I'm not talented at that. I'm not good at that. I should spend, s- spend time doing something I am talented or good at. When really, all, the, all that their, their lack of ability is signaling is they haven't spend ver- spent very much time doing it yet, right? So, so what's nice is all of the research basically says that there is, an, in this early stage of, of skill acquisition, there is no such thing as natural talent. So the first time Tiger Woods picked up a golf club, he was as horrible as you were, yep. right? He's just practiced for, for much longer. And, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in, in understanding that, you know, those first couple hours are going to be frustrating and that's okay. If, if you spend your time practicing in a smart way, it's not going to be very long before you're going to be very good at it. Mm, I think one of the things that, that you write about in the book is that, like, I'm hopefully going to get this right. The, you know, the major barrier, which is sort of what we're talking about right now, is not sort of a, a physical attribute or or even intelligence to a certain thing. It's that emotional skill yes. of pushing through and giving yourself that freedom and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's it's an interesting kind of concept for a lot of people to think that the ability to, to gain a new skill is not whether your intelligence level or your physical prowess. It's it's literally your emotional um, intelligence almost. Yeah, no, that was the the biggest surprise uh, for for me in this in this process. Uh, when when I started doing the research uh, behind skill acquisition and, and and how to do it quickly, I really expected, uh, you know, digging into the research literature and, and and figuring out what works and what doesn't. I expected it to be, you know, an an intellectual cognitive tips, tricks, and hacks kind of process. Right? Here's a whole bunch of things that you can do to 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 suck in a lot of information and stick it in your long-term memory and, 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 you know, get very good by studying correctly. 
And what I found, both in the research and, and in my own experience testing these sorts of methods, is we're all smart enough, way smart enough to, to do this. Uh, we're all strong enough. Um, the, the major barriers are not physical. They're not intellectual. They're emotional. It's, it's getting yourself to the point of committing and, and, and overcoming that, oh, this looks way too big. I'm not sure if I can do this type of feeling. Um, so, so the early doubt or the early intimidation and then overcoming that early frustration of getting started and not being good and, and kind of wrestling with, with that cognitive dissonance that, that comes from, I'm trying to do something that I'm very clearly not good at mm. and, and how to kind of push through that. So you get to the point where you've spent enough time to build very real skills so you can accomplish something that, that has deep meaning in your life, whatever that might be. Mm, absolutely. So you're listening to Preneurcast here with uh, Josh Kaufman, author of The First 20 Hours. Now, Josh, let me ask you a bit of a slight change of direction about this word you keep using so much, which is practice. Yes. I'd love to talk about sort of how to almost deconstruct practice in a way because, you know, you talk about in the book about doing uh, practice on an, a daily basis as opposed to immersion, which is something that we've spoken a, a lot about, which I'm a believer in. I'd love to sort of sure. chat about your, your take from your experiences and your research around why you think that, you know, almost an hour a day of practice is more effective than 20 hours over three days. Right, right. So, so the, the whole idea of the importance of, of practice, and this was actually one, one of the really great things uh, that, that Dr. Erickson uh, coined in, in his reach, research on, on um, expert level performance, this whole idea of deliberate practice, mm. right? So, so it's not just kind of dabbling around with something and, and hoping that you improve. It's not fiddling around or, 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 you know, just kind of ambiently soaking up things. Deliberate practice is very intentionally and very systematically sitting down to practice with an eye towards something specific you want to improve, right? So it's very focused. Um, and, and, you know, the, the connotation of deliberate, it's like you're really, really paying attention mm -hmm. when you practice. And so deliberate practice really is the core of skill acquisition. The more deliberate practice you put in, in general, the better you'll get. The, the rate of, of your improvement will be extremely high at the beginning, and then uh, over time, as, as you improve, that, that rate of learning will, will very naturally taper off, right? Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea of the learning curve. Absolutely. And so, you know, deliberate practice is the core of, of skill acquisition, all, all types of skill acquisition. So there are a number of different ways that you can go about doing that. And in general, the, the, probably the most widely known method of, of what would qualify as, as rapid skill acquisition is the idea of immersion, mm. right? So you want to learn a language. Let's say you want to learn Japanese. Yep. Uh, you know, sell, sell your house and sell hop all your an stuff and, and pack your bag, hop a flight and, and live in J Japan for three months. And lo and behold, by the, by the end of that experience, you will know a lot of Japanese. <laughs> That's a very strong positive constraint as well. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So, you know, in general, immersion works. It works extremely well. The, the challenge is that very few of us are, are in a position where we can drop absolutely everything and go live in Japan for three months, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, you know, th I think part of the challenge, so, so if you have an immersion opportunity, whatever that looks like, and you're at a point in your life where you, where you can really follow that opportunity, fantastic. Go do it. You will learn a ton. Uh, the challenge comes when when people think that that's the only way that you can learn something quickly, mm. and so they 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 s wait sometimes their entire lives for an immersion opportunity that doesn't come. When when really, if you rearrange your schedule to to put in just a little bit of time every day to practice this thing that is meaningful to you, you can improve a lot in in a very short period of time. And so, you know, just, just to put it in context, 20 hours of practice is, is about 40, 45 minutes a day for about a month. Yep. And so, you know, if, if you can rearrange your schedule to really put some hard focus time, you know, half hour, 45 minutes a day, you can make a ton of improvement in a couple weeks to a month. And, and that's something that, that I've, I think is doable regardless of what, what stage in your life, what stage, where, where you are in your life, right? How, no matter how busy your schedule is, you can probably find half an hour-ish yeah, Even with a crying day. baby. 
even yeah i mean it's, <laughs> the funny story while while i was doing this and well part of the reason that i i was doing this research in the first place is i run a business my wife runs a business and we had a baby yeah and all of a sudden i i just had zero free time to to dabble with things that you know that my my general method for for learning new things prior to that was just oh i'm interested and i'll i'll dabble for a couple months and and you know develop a certain level of skill but it was really super inefficient yeah and i didn't have time to dabble anymore and so you know it, it became a challenge like if i only have maybe an hour if i'm lucky every day to sit down and learn something new how can I use that hour as as effectively as possible? And that's that's where this whole method came from. Mm. And I think something about this too is that for people who are doing uh, or trying to learn a skill to better their lives, not just for enjoyment. So what, what I mean by that is, let's say you know learning to play the guitar or even play golf sure. is is an enjoyment side of side of things, and you should be able to juggle your schedule for for, for that enjoyment. But if you're trying to grow a business or you're trying to actually master your personal finances, if you can't get out of bed 45 minutes earlier for every day for at least one month so you can become a better business person, so you can manage your family money a lot better, then there's bigger questions to answer in your life almost is that do you really want that outcome then if you're not willing to, to give up 45 minutes of sleep? Now, obviously, totally. there's some people who have a crying baby that are up three times a night and you need the extra 45 minutes because it's been sucked away by the little one. <laughs> right. You know, right. Five, five month old, you know, I, I know exactly what that's like. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally feel for you right now. <laughs> I might have to ask some skill acquisition about changing nappies and, and, and getting them to self settle and stuff like that, but it might be a different yep. call. But, you know, this is the thing is if it is really something. In most people's lives, they're sleeping eight, nine hours a night. And yes, you need that amount of sleep long term. But for the sake of 30 days to change your life, to really develop that strong skill, it's going to make an effect on your, you know, the other, you know, 16 hours of your awake time, be it a better business, more peace with better finances, whatever it might be. Get your ass out of bed 45 minutes earlier. Like, that, that, totally. that, that's, that's, there's no excuse around that. And, and there are so many high leverage skills that, that you could learn in a very short period of time. That will that will change your business. Mm. So so I brought up programming earlier. Yep. Oh my gosh! If um if if you think of every business is just a system, right? It's a <laughs> system designed to create a very specific outcome, yep. which is a happy customer and more money in your bank account, so you could do it again. If you think of your business as a system, programming is just a way of making that system very specific, so it can run without you. Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's if there's any sort of repeatable thing that you find yourself paying attention to over and over and over again, if it can be handled uh, by a person in a repetitive uh, way, you can create a program that does that for you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the most re uh, rewarding things that I've done from from a, a business standpoint is is learning to program because now, you know, I, I like to call it I, I have a my own little robot army uh, that does my bidding. <laughs> It's great, you know, and, and, and one of the kind of idiosyncratic ways that, that I really prefer to run businesses is it's just me. I don't have employees. I don't have contractors. It's just me. And so, you know, instead of spending all of my time doing these very repetitive things, I can invest maybe 10 or 20 hours creating a program that does it for me. And once it's done, it's done. And so, you know... And every single time that program runs, I save myself so much time. It's it's crazy, and and so you know, programming is a, is a high leverage skill. Uh, learning things like persuasive writing uh, for for marketing and sales and and uh, you know doing copywriting and and creating offers and testing, and you know. Uh, public speaking skills. All of those things are things that you could learn how to do in a very short period of time and they can change your business completely. It just takes some some time and investment figuring out how they work. Mm. I, I think, you know, the copywriting one is a brilliant example. If you, if you have no skills in, in copywriting in, in that sort of element of your business, if you can start developing this practice routine for, you know, an hour a day for this, you know, next 30 days or 45 minutes, whatever it might be, and then once you develop that skill, Rather than turning that practice time to something else, turn that scheduled habit that you formed into actual action implementation. So you start writing Absolutely. a blog post every day or a new sales letter every day or tweaking the, the control in your marketing campaign every day. So you actually turn that practice into routine, which I think you, you touched on in the book as well. Yeah. So so one of the nice things uh, about 
the 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 learning method I t- I talk about in the first twenty hours is that you don't have to stop after twenty hours, right? <laughs> that's just that's just the beginning, and so you know sometimes within those first twenty hours you reach the level of skill that you want to, and so you just go out and, and use it and and yay for you, right? But you can also, if if you want to keep getting better at, at something that that has a lot of value to either your business or your life, you just do it again, right? Mm-hmm. So so you reach a certain level of skill, you assess where you are, you figure out where you want to go next, and then you do the same thing again to keep leveling up, whatever that looks like for your particular skill. And so, yeah, you know, it's things like really learning how copywriting works, oh my gosh, can change your business overnight. Mm. Um and and it doesn't take very long to reach to reach a really good level of skill, and then you can spend your time using it, and that can change your business. Absolutely. Well, Josh, really do appreciate your time. The first twenty hours is a fantastic book. You cover a whole bunch of stuff in the sort of the same sort of light as what we've spoken about today, but you also cover uh, a whole bunch of your actual, I guess, case studies for want of a better term, around you actually going about learning. Everything I think from yoga to uh, touch typing. What, what was the craziest thing you actually learned along the journey, and, and what's the craziest story you've got? Oh, the probably the the, the craziest thing was one of the things I, I learned how to do for the book was windsurfing. Yeah, uh, which I had never done before, <laughs> and I I am not um, as you'd call it a very coordinated individual, <laughs> and, and I I didn't I didn't actually uh, I. Didn't think about this before I started, but I actually I had zero experience balancing on a moving surface. So like no skateboarding, no Surfing, no like anything. Yeah, snowboarding. Yep. So, so oh yeah, oh my gosh, I I drank so much lake water that month. <laughs> kind of really crazy, but but also a really good example of you know being uh, demonstrably extremely bad at something, having zero experience, and 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 understanding and and being able to see just how far I came. In, in practicing this in a smart way, it's super fun now. Mm. And, and so I, I think that's, the, uh, that's the, the real hopeful message here is uh, you could believe, you know, in the back of your mind, there's probably something you've always wanted to learn how to do, I, I'm, I'm willing to wager. And so just, you know, t- take a moment and think for yourself, like what is that thing that, that you, would be super cool for, for you to learn for whatever reason? And no matter how bad you're afraid you might be at it this process works and it works well and so it's you know you can take that thing you've wanted to learn for a long time and a month from now you could actually be doing it and and getting value from it and having fun with it and so uh you know the general message is don't wait start now because you know that that thing you've always wanted to do is is well within your reach yeah, and it's not 10 10 10,000 hours it's only 20 no. and 20 is achievable so, nowhere close yeah, yeah. So let me ask you the, the final question that I ask every single guest we have on the show, Josh. And that question is, what is the one question I didn't ask you that I should have? Um, this has been a pretty comprehensive interview, actually. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the, um, the, the biggest thing is what do you want to learn and why, probably. Yeah. And I would ask that that. Uh, to you first, like you know, we've we've been talking about this this method of learning new things. How are you going to use this? Me personally, great question. Yeah. Um, look, I think it is for me. It's it's you know the, the baby sort of stuff. That's kind of a forced learning, really. It's not really a choice, so to speak. Now that he's uh, here and giving us beautiful smiles and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, oh, that's a very good question. What is on my my hit list of learning? Um, what is it at the moment that I'm trying to learn more? Being, being actually, that's probably, I sort of touched on it before actually, just uh, more of a personal financing. It's quite funny. I've been very, very successful over the years with business, but uh, need, I want to get better at sort of just personal finance side of stuff. You know, not so, not so trading stocks and stuff, but just really increase the actual personal side of stuff. I've been very, very good at turning the tap on to increase the income into the uh, the business, just need to, and, and into the personal life. And now about just, you know, setting some stuff up for the family a bit more uh, than I have before than having just a whole bunch of cash in a bank account. So that's sure. sort of the, I guess that's the skill around that, I guess, is probably a, a good way to put it. Excellent. Yeah, it's... um. It, it's so fun. I'm I'm actually uh, in the process of. I've been doing so many so many podcasts and radio interviews and and having a good time doing that. I don't have 
I mean, this is something that I'm, I'm practicing trying to get better at. And so, you know, that's, that's been super fun. And, you know, the, the fun thing about this particular project is that, you know, the, the method itself is, you know, may seem like incredible common sense. Um, it is in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. It's really, you know, sitting down and systematically doing it. That's, that's where you get the value. But, you know, the, the fun that I've been having with this particular project is starting to hear stories from people who are actually using it to learn cool things. Mm. And, and I'll, I'll share three of my favorites so awesome. far. So uh, I actually just, if, if you go to, um, so the, the website for the book, if you're interested, first20hours.com, yep. ton of information, you can, you can see everything about the book. I'm doing uh, interviews with, with people who are using this method to do cool things. And, and the first one, which actually uh, just went, went up a few days ago, was uh, a guy by the name of John Hart, and he learned how to fly an airplane in 16 and a half hours. So, <laughs> awesome. go, yeah, going from knowing absolutely nothing about aviation to his first solo flight, 16 and a half hours, just like super cool. Uh, I heard there was a, a 90 year old woman who sat down and, and is, is learning how to play the piano because she's always wanted to, right? So, so it doesn't matter how old you are, this stuff works really, really well. And then uh, my, my last, probably my, my favorite, unexpected skill, which I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about. There's, there's a gentleman who is in the process of using this method to learn sumo wrestling. Wow. No joke. So, you know, I, I, I think that's the really fun part about this particular project for me is, is you really can use it to learn anything, uh, either business or, or personal. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing way more stories about people actually going out into the world and using this to do something cool. Awesome. So someone's going to learn how to raise alpacas or um, yeah. hot air balloon pilot. Um, just first20hours.com and uh, hit you up there. Is that the best place? Yeah, that's the best place. Awesome. Josh, thank you so much for your time. The book, The First 20 Hours, is available where all good books are sold, um, primarily Amazon. Um, so thank you much for your time, buddy. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> So there you go, folks. Um, Pete and Josh there covering, again, as always, such a wide range of stuff, but all completely relevant to uh, to you, not only in personal development, but in actual kind of business skills. Pete, you, you drilled down there with Josh quite a lot into how this rapid skill acquisition applies to people in business rather than just these kind of hobby skills like golf or drawing or whatever. Mm. Um, I thought that was, that was uh, some good stuff that Josh put across there. No, very, very uh, intelligent guy, clearly uh, very good at articulating his message and, um, you know, clearly good at learning skills because he's uh, proven it in a number of different areas inside the book. So I highly recommend it. Uh, it's definitely worth uh, checking out and having a bit of a read. Particularly, I think, you know, the, the part of the book where he talks about the theory and the strategy for learning, when he sort of starts sort of talking about his journey, I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't really the, the meat of the book that I loved. It was more the theory and the strategy and the technology that he talks about. Uh, of skill acquisition, which I think is the real takeaway from this, from what he shares. Absolutely. I mean, I, when I was listening to it through, I I would remember thinking that his the way that he showed because he talks about you know breaking down what you're trying to learn into its component parts. And when he talked about business, it was very interesting. You know, he he took his experience obviously from his book, The Personal MBA. But it was very interesting to see how his breakdown of business and this idea of focusing on a particular part of your business was pretty much parallel to our own seven levers mm. um, in terms of, you know, identifying sub areas of your business to focus on and then develop skills in that area. Um, so, you know, if nothing else, folks, everything that, that Josh was talking about today uh, really is applicable in those areas. You know, if you don't know much about traffic generation, um, the first of the seven levers, then, then focusing on one part, one skill, one tactic in traffic generation you know, as, as the thing for you to learn is going to make that huge difference and, and that 10% increase that we talk about all the time. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, Pete. You know, you know I'm a great student of, uh, sounds silly, I'm a student of learning. I'm, I'm always fascinated <laughs> about ways of acquiring skills. Um, and I, I was attracted to this book because it, it almost seemed a bit like a bit like that the scene from The Matrix, you know, where the guy kind of Yes. Leans back and then he sits up and goes, I know Kung Fu. Yeah. That would be <laughs> awesome, wouldn't it, to just go like, I always had this, you know, envisage all this dream when I was younger that I could go and shake someone's hand and just like get all their their knowledge out of a handshake. That'd be really cool. Yeah. 
but I mean, it, it, the, he opened with 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 the with the important perspective, which is you know, the, those those first twenty hours will get you to a level of proficiency, and maybe that's all you need. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, we can we can go on this topic for for a very long time, but I, I I just I think he's got a good perspective, and I think it's a great way, as you say, the the, the meat of that was the breaking down. The, the thing you want to learn, identifying and breaking it down. So it's it's a, a great thing. And folks, you know, as always, you know, a lot of the books that we talk about on Preneurcast are available as audio books. And I think this is a great one to to have as an audio book because it is kind of story story based. You know, you can pick up a lot from it just while you're walking around or doing your daily chores, as, as I do with a lot of material. Um, we recommend, uh, and one of our sponsors is Audible Books. And if you go over to audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast, if you're not already a member, then you can start a free trial and the free trial allows you to download your first book for free. Um, so you could download Josh's book if you're not already a member of Audible. And if you are, well, dive on there and, uh, and check out the first 20 hours from Josh Kaufman. Um, cool. For, uh, I, as always, you know, we, we, uh, we try and keep things to time. So, and I think after last week, most people have heard quite enough of me, Pete. <laughs> so uh, let's just remind people to, uh, you know, stay part of the community. Preneurmarketing.com is the home of the show. You can get transcripts of all the episodes. You can get all the show notes and the links and a whole bunch more great regular content over at Preneurmarketing.com. And if you happen to be on iTunes buying Miley Cyrus's new single for some crazy reason, uh, make sure you jump over to the podcast page and leave a comment because that is uh, a huge benefit benefit for us as well it's a great way of saying thanks and we do appreciate every single comment that we do get on itunes so please uh do us a solid and uh leave one absolutely and as i pointed out last week we're now on soundcloud as well another place you can you can listen to us uh get hold of the the latest versions um of uh, latest editions of all the shows and uh, folks, we are now that uh, Preneur Marketing is fully up and running, or as they say, fully operational, we have our little audio voicemail button on the right hand side of the site over at preneurmarketing.com. So you can pop on there and just very quickly click that button and record us a little message with your microphone. Um, and you never know, you, we might contact you and ask you if you don't mind being featured on the show. Absolutely. Talk to you all next week. Bye, folks. <laughs> been enjoying another fine episode of Prunercast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.prunermarketing.com or drop them a line via Prunercast at prunergroup.com.